Hi everyone, it's John. Welcome back to my channel. It is December 27th, 2022, and before the year ended, I wanted to come back to you for one last book review. Maybe one more video after this, but it won't be a book review. A few months ago, I was approached by someone on Instagram, the publicist for a, a book publisher by the name of Spiegel and Grau. His name is Stefan, and he asked me if I would be interested in a few of their books in return for honest reviews. And of course, I said yes. I almost never get offers like this, but at least one of the books looked very interesting. So I'm going to start out with the two books that I won't be reviewing that Stefan also sent me. Um, these are uh, contemporary novels that Spiegel and Grau put out. This is Skullwater by Heinz Insu Fenkel. And I'll read you the blurb on the back. The son of a Korean mother and a father in the U.S. Army, Insu and his half-and-half -half friends spend their day skipping school, selling scavenged Western goods on the black market, and testing the boundaries between adolescence and adulthood. When Insu hears a legend that water collected in a human skull will cure any sickness, he vows to find some in order to heal his ailing big uncle, a geomancer uprooted by the Korean War who's been exiled by the family to a mountain cave to die. But Big Uncle has embraced his solitude as well as his fate and attempts to teach his nephew that life isn't limited to what we can see or think we know. Drawing on Korean folklore and traditions, Skullwater is a sweeping tale of friendship, displacement, and identity. Uh, again, this is from... What does it say? This is a, a not-for-sale copy. There we go. There's, there's the Spiegel and Grau. Uh, symbol right there. Skullwater by Heinz and Sue Finkel. I plan to get around to this eventually, but this is not the one that immediately spoke to me, so uh, it'll be at a later date, maybe. Uh, one more, uh, another novel. This is uh, Go is a River by Shelley Reed. And uh, on the back, this says Victoria Nash is just a teenager in the 1940s, but she runs the household on her family's peach farm in the ranch town of Iola, Colorado, the sole surviving female in a family of troubled men. Wilson Moon is a young drifter with a mysterious past, displaced from his tribal land in the Four Corners region, who wants to believe one place is just like another. When Victoria encounters Will on a street corner, their unexpected connection ignites as much passion and danger as, and as many revelations as secrets. Victoria flees into the beautiful but harsh wilderness of the nearby mountains, and then tragedy strikes. Living in a small hut, she struggles to survive in the unforgiving conditions with no clear notion of what her future will be. What happens afterward is her quest to regain all that she's lost, even as the Gunnison River rises to submerge her homeland and the only life she's ever known. A go is a river is a story of love and loss, but also of finding a home and family and resilience and love where it's least expected. A go is a river by Shelley Reed. And here's the one that I wanted to actually review for you today read it a couple of months ago and was just really, really quite taken with it for reasons I'll get into in the body of the review. I won't <clears throat> read the back for you because, well, the title kind of gives it away and plus this is a review video, so you're going to get a review anyway. And, and the content of what it's all about. It's called Bravehearted, The Women of the American West by Katie Hickman. Um, so, usually in stories about the American West, you get a lot of stuff, well, you get a lot of mythology. <laughs> For some reason, these stories love to 
you know, collect a lot of mythological characters and events around them. And they get simplified, oversimplified stories of outlaws, vengeance, sort of these renegades who go out and find justice on their own terms. And I guess it comes as no surprise that Stories like this are kind of dominated by the actions of men, right? But over the past few decades, especially since the 60s and 70s, with the rise of movements like microhistory and history from the ground up instead of from just rulers, leaders, kings, monarchs, diplomats, but from everyday ordinary people, we also started to get the appearance of women's history and rediscovering their unique contributions to history all over the world. And this is originally started in academia, but uh, has spilled over into popular history like this book. And in Bravehearted, the American, uh, the women of the American West, Katie Hickman looks at some of these really treacherous journeys that women took from the eastern part of the states when they went west to uh, cross the Rocky Mountains. And it uh, looks at that journey through a broad swath of women, from Christian missionaries to uh, business women to sex workers. She focuses on the years around the middle third of the 19th century. Uh, in one of the books, strong points is the variety and the diversity of women's voices and stories that are included. She opens the book, in fact, with the harrowing story of Narcissa Whitman and Eliza Spaulding, who, along with their husbands, and to quote the author, an abyss of cultural misunderstanding, big understatement, uh, wished to cross west of the Rockies to proselytize to the native people. Whitman, uh, in, in fact, uh, Liza Spaulding too, they both went with their husbands as well. Uh, and Whitman's husband was named Marcus. They, they settled, all of them settled among the Cayuse Indians in, once they had reached their destination. Not Terribly long after, a few, within a few years, an epidemic of measles broke out among the native population, and Cayuse leaders believed that Marcus was purposefully trying to infect them, and especially infect the native children, to kill them. I want to urge you to read the book, so I won't mention how it turns out, but it doesn't turn out well for the Whitman family, as you might find out from a quick Google search. She also tells the story of the Donner Party, which uh, doesn't need to be recounted because it has a, a better known, I think, story, at least to a lot of Americans probably know what happened in the Donner Party, and has a just as unfortunate outcome. Maybe the most inspiring story that Katie Hickman tells is the one of a woman named Biddy Mason. She was one of the very first African-American slaves to make the trek west. Mason belonged to a white man by the name of Robert Smith, one of the original followers of Brigham Young. And she followed him west in a wagon train. The whole time, just, just try to imagine this, making a 1,500-mile, 2,000-mile trek west into territory you know absolutely nothing in about nothing about in horrid weather sometimes sometimes half starving while raising a newborn tending to two other children and being in charge of robert smith's livestock Just imagine the kind of woman that, that Biddy Mason must have been. Under the false pretense of winning her freedom 
for her and her children once they arrived west. Uh, she, she followed them to Texas and then to California, thinking that she was going to get that freedom. But when they got there, it ended up that he had lied to her and he wasn't going to give it to her. She sued him, and after a long, multi-year protracted legal battle, she finally won her case. And after she became a freed woman, she parlayed her knowledge of midwifery and nursing and herbal medicine into an enormous fortune, the equivalent of millions of dollars today, by going into real estate and then deciding to give much of it away in generous acts of philanthropy. And just as a side note, in her free time, which apparently she managed to find some of, she also co-founded the Los Angeles First American Methodist, uh, First African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, the book ends on the tragic note that is probably inevitable for that everyone sees coming at the end of a book of, of Americans traveling west, and that is the destruction of the Native American populations that lived there, perpetrated by the actions of both individual settlers and the American government, particularly the Grant administration. Through the systematic decimation of tens of millions of American buffalo and the wars waged on Native populations, by 1880 or thereabouts, their numbers were as low as about 20% of what they were in the 1840s or 1850s. And the few that remained had been permanently and involuntarily pushed onto reservations. And to add insult to injury, their children were forced to attend Christian schools that aimed to, quote-unquote, civilize them. So uh, these are not all the stories that were told. I just chose three or four of of the most interesting aspects of the book. It tells, I say, maybe the stories of eight to 10 or 12 women in uh, sort of an interconnected, interwoven way. And despite the grit, uh, the desperation, the desolation that really pervades a lot of the women's lives that Katie Hickman talks about, there is nevertheless there kind of has to be this sense of resilience and determination about them. You can hear it in the story of, of Biddy Mason. Uh, women were always present in the American West, despite how little you might hear about them from some writers, uh, despite the way these stories are sometimes told, like I alluded to earlier. But it's really refreshing to read a book that recenters the story on them to give them their pride of place. Uh, Katie Hickman's history as a writer of fiction is pretty clear here. She tells the story in a kind of a novelistic way. She can paint a sense of place and a character, even though the characters were obviously real historical people, in a very, very real palpable way. She's a really, really talented writer who also just happens to be a pretty good popular historian, too. Uh, like I said, kind of, write, kind of writes with the flair of a novelist, because she is a novelist. I spent a lot of years as a reader mostly uninterested in histories of the West for reasons I mentioned. The, the kind of machismo doesn't really do anything for me. But by evening out this balance, I think this book goes a long way in wanting me to learn more, at least more about the role of women and maybe eventually more about the settling of the population of the West overall. Uh, a really, really good book, a strong, well-written book, and a wonderful place to sort of get your 
your feet wet with history if you are intimidated by that genre. This is Bravehearted, The Women of the American West by Katie Hickman. I will see you maybe in a couple of days. Bye, everyone.